The next few moments are devoted to silent prayer, giving each of you the privacy of your priesthood so that we might utilize the standard operating procedure. And that standard operating procedure is the utilization of 1 John 1, 9, which states if we name our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all wrongdoing. Therefore, with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful opportunity this evening to study your word. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us and make these things which we note a source of blessing and challenge to us. And may God the Holy Spirit, our mentor and our teacher, bring to our memory those things which we have forgotten. And may we uh, note the fact that over the past messages we have studied salvation, we have studied eternal security, and we have studied rebound. Therefore, may these foundation of the word, may this milk of the word be a foundation for us to build upon. And may we become, start to understand more and more the doctrines of your word. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Now, we left off last time talking about the authority of the pastor-teacher and the authority that God has bestowed upon the pastor. We also uh, left off talking about the rebound technique and what it means to rebound and the false applications of rebound. And uh, then we left off with James 5:15 through 5:16, which is uh, nothing more than talking about the authority of the pastor teacher. Now, I am not one who likes to wield a whip around and act as if I have uh, some uh, type of authority, even though I do have an authority as your pastor teacher. And you called me here to uh, Piedmont, South Carolina, to teach you the Word of God. And as as such, I have been given by God as your pastor an authority. And in fact, uh, for those people uh, who know me personally, and that is uh, a few of you, uh, for those of you who know me outside of this pulpit, you know that I am a rather uh, meek and mild person in, in terms of personality. However, I will follow the protocol God has set forth, and the protocol God set forth was for me to be the authority. And believe me, I will wield that authority as I understand the gravity of what uh, my job is. And that's why I am up on a Tuesday night after I have just worked uh, for uh, eight and a half hours. And I worked eight and a half hours Monday. And my boss is uh, begging uh, for overtime. And so I'm here on this Tuesday night. Uh, because I want to impart to you the Word of God. I want to see uh, all of you move to maturity. And if you ask me to come uh, uh, teach you some doctrine, obviously uh, you're doing that for a reason. Therefore, I am available. And uh, if I did not uh, utilize the authority that God has uh, ordained for me, then uh, you people would run over me like a uh, possum on a uh, country Georgia road. And that's about all there is to it. So therefore, I want you to know that I take heed to a certain verse uh, particularly. And it's a verse that Paul gave to Timothy. Now, Timothy was a uh, rather young man. I don't know exactly how old he was. But let's look at 1 Timothy 4.12. Let no one look down on you because you are young. Now, this doesn't mean he is young spiritually. The Apostle Paul would not ordain someone who was young spiritually. This means that Timothy was a young man. Which means uh, he's uh, quite unique in that uh, he's a young person who is spiritually mature. And being young, a lot of the women in the church uh, like to make an issue out of that. And they like to, and they just ran right over Timothy. And uh, he was spiritually mature, but he had a lot of problems in his spiritual life in that he did not know how to wield the authority that God had given to him. And I want to let you know right now that uh, while I have not 
yet had to wield any of this uh, uh, authority, and I would have no uh, reservations about doing so. So let's look at 1 Timothy 4.12. Let no one look down on you because you were young, but set an example for the believers in your speech, conduct, love, faithfulness, and purity. So love and faithfulness is easy enough to explain, and that is faithfulness for a pastor is to study and teach, study and teach, study and teach. And uh, therefore, that is what I'm doing. That's why on this Tuesday night, even though uh, none of you are able to be uh, present with me physically, you can get this on tape. And uh, an aside, this is no extra charge, but you can grow up just as fast under tapes as you can face to face. I grew up to spiritual maturity listening to tapes. I could listen to a tape any time I wished, and a lot of times in, in my teenage years, I would listen to three kernel uh, theme tapes a day, a lot, of, especially during the summer when I would be able to work with my father and have that ability to do so. I would listen to three tapes a day. And then later on, when I uh, got another job at a machine shop, I uh, would listen to uh, as many tapes as I could for the whole eight hours I was there. Sometimes I would work overtime and get more than eight hours of tapes. And uh, instead of listening to music, I'd just plop a tape on and listen to it and concentrate, in fact. And um, this is where a lot of my spiritual growth came from. Actually, it's where all of it came from. It's from non-face-to-face -face teaching. Now, a lot of people will uh, give you a bunch of malarkey that you have to be face-to-face. -face. There's something about it. Well, let me tell you something. I have seen a lot of face-to-face -face people, and a lot of those face-to-face -face people do not have enough doctrine to fill a thimble compared to uh, some of the people I know who have listened to tapes day after day and that's because they have not been consistent they have gone to church maybe twice on Sunday probably just once on Sunday and um, they've obviously have some type of kink in their spiritual life and they think they're doing something great by being face to face face to face is a privilege it does not mean that uh, you will grow spiritually however now when I got the chance to be face to face I, face to face I took that chance and I enjoyed it and in fact um, uh, it, it, it was nice for me to be face to face. But to say that I could not grow up to maturity without being face to face is a legalistic lie. And don't fall for that. And if somebody gives you some garbage from Hebrews, and it's not garbage, it's just they don't understand what Hebrews is trying to say. They say exhort one another. Well, the exhort is the pastor doing the exhorting, and the pastor can exhort from a tape just as much as he can face to face. Therefore, I have uh, nothing against you listening to this on tape. And in fact, this is the only means by which you will get this. It will be from a tape, because we do not have the means or the ability at this point to have face to face teaching midweek. And if ever that chance occurs, of course, we will take it. But as of now, we don't have that chance. We have two messages on Sunday. And uh, now, during midweek, I'm going to crank out some more that you can listen to on your own. As I know, all of us have uh, certain things we have to do. Some of you work uh, uh, second shift. I have to work a first shift job, which means... Uh, it would be very difficult for me to uh, uh, drive all the way down to Piedmont and then give a message and drive back and study. It's a lot easier for me to study right here at home and crank out the messages on tape. But if ever uh, it becomes available, and, and this will be in God's time, if it ever does uh, come to fruition, then that will be on God's time, and I'm not worried about it. But I want at least to let you know that I... Um, Understand the enormity, the uh, solemnity of the fact that of this gift and the fact that I must impart to you Bible doctrine and I must impart to you the importance of Bible doctrine. That's why for this past week I've been studying more than I've ever studied in my life and that's why you are receiving at this point right now uh, doctrine midweek. 
and uh, you will get this on Sunday, and uh, you can listen to it next week. And so by the time you're listening to this, I'll be making more messages. So, of course, uh, from First uh, Timothy 4.12, Let no one look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in your speech, conduct, love, faithfulness, and purity. So I'm going to set an example for you by studying and teaching. And therefore, you will know I'm very serious about uh, this uh, gift I have been given. Therefore, uh, we're going to start off now where we left off last time, and um, th- that is with James 5.15. Now, we were studying rebound. We were studying the fact that if we name our sins to God, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all wrongdoing. And we noted that there is no public acknowledgement of sin necessary. In fact, it is prohibited. You should not stand up in front of a congregation and tell everybody the sins you have committed. It is none of their business. That's between you you and God, and you have the privacy of your priesthood. And we even noted Psalm uh, 54, I believe it was, where David said, Against God and God only have I sinned. And uh, we noted uh, David's rebound and the things associated with that. And then we came upon uh, these uh, two verses in James, which are rather odd. Now, from the English translation, <clears throat> excuse me, from uh, strictly the English translation that you have in your Bible, you would think that you need to go and name your sins to a fellow believer, no matter who it is, just someone you know, maybe your neighbor, whoever, uh, the person sitting beside you in church, and guess what I've done? I've uh, committed this sin. And you think you need to do this for exhortation or whatever. That's what you would get reading from the English in these verses. But of course, the English translation of these two verses in James is absolutely pathetic. It is disgusting. And no wonder so many Christians are walking around confused. Yet the, the, the Greek translation has been made available, and thank God it's been made available. And for me, it's been made available by uh, Colonel R.B. Thiem, an expert in the Greek language, in the Greek languages used in the New Testament. All eight of them, Homeric, Greek, all the way up to classical and uh, All the different types, eight different types of Greek, he knew them. I don't have time to study that Greek. Not now, anyway. Maybe in the future. But now I don't. But I will go from his translation, which I know is correct, and um, I know is accurate. And therefore, 515. And the prayer from the doctrinal one will deliver the hopelessly sick one. This is James 515. And the prayer from the doctrinal one. Now... This is the Greek word presbuteros. Now, it is in uh, the uh, plural. Presbuteros, in this case, is in the plural. But that does not mean there is more than one pastor per local church. It's plural in that there is a pastor of a local church, and then there is another pastor of a local church, and then another pastor of another local church. So it is presbuteros plural in that there are many pastors of many different local churches, yet there is only one pastor over one local church, and that's the way it's supposed to be. Now, um, some of us have the habit, and I'm not uh, picking on any one here. I don't know your habits, uh, but uh, I know that there are people who have the habit from hopping from one pastor to another pastor to another pastor. The, uh, the Bible calls those spiritual whores. Now, I stuck with one pastor my whole life, and that pastor was Colonel R.B. Theme Jr. He was my right pastor, still is to this day, and I still listen to him to this day. He knows more than I do about the Bible, of course. He was the great pioneer of our age uh, concerning the Bible, the greatest pastor in the past 2,000 years. So I say to you, if you listen to Colonel Thame, well, my goodness, you've got the best uh, doctrinal teacher in the world since the Apostle Paul. Keep listening. 
That's what I say to you. But in term, and now if you're listening to me, well, that's fine. You want to listen to me. And if you want to listen to about ten uh, other different pastors at the same time, that's none of my business. And in fact, I don't care if you do or not. That's not the point that I am making. The point I am making is that if you have a multitude of pastors teaching you uh, different doctrines, it opens the door up for confusion. It opens the door up. Uh, what if one pastor is giving false doctrine? Now I'm talking, you're going with uh, ten different pastors here. That's like going with ten different ladies. You're going to get confused eventually. You will. Uh, you can't respond to ten different authorities like that concerning the spiritual life and not get confused. You will get confused. Now, uh, everything I teach, I take uh, complete responsibility for. Uh, yet I want you to know that uh, that what when I do stand before you and teach, you're going to get the correct word of God. I am not going to lead you astray. And that's one thing you should understand concerning this ministry is that you will get it correctly. I won't, If I don't understand it, I won't teach it until I do. And that's the way it's going to be and that's the way it's going to function. But the Bible does talk about spiritual whores. And that is people who have itching ears looking for a different personality here and there and everywhere. And now in terms of those uh, people who are teaching doctrine, well, that might be a different situation in that you're getting doctrine. But as a sheep hopping from pastor to pastor, it's it, I don't recommend it at all. And uh, if you have trouble with this ministry, I recommend fully. In fact, I implore you, get the tapes uh, made by Colonel R.B. Theme. He was the pioneer. He has... Uh, uh, come up with some things and he's right up there with Paul that's all I have to say and a man like Colonel Thien comes along every 2,000 years and I can tell you this because I've been studying feverishly his notes I've been studying feverishly from his tapes and I can tell you he is an absolute genius uh, mentally and, uh, and when it comes to spiritual IQ unmatched absolutely unmatched so if it is your desire to uh, stick with tapes by all means stick with the kernel tapes in fact i uh, would encourage it but uh, since uh, there is a reason for me to be teaching at this uh, piedmont bible church since there is a reason you have called me here i'm going to give you the scripture and i'm going to give you the uh, correct scripture and it's not going to be incorrect by the time it comes from my lips and I want you to understand that and I want you to be completely clear on that fact so 515 in the prayer from the doctrinal one would deliver the hopelessly sick one the hopelessly sick one is the reversionist who is about to die this in face to face with death we have not studied the doctrine of reversionism as of yet and if you don't understand what that is stick with me we'll get to that eventually but I have to explain this uh, in 515 in order that you uh, will not be confused and in order that you know I am not skipping around any verses that uh, uh, might con seem to contradict themselves, but verses never do contradict themselves. And the prayer from the doctrinal one would deliver the hopelessly sick one, that is the believer in reversionism, who is dying the sin face to face with death, and he suddenly has a change of mind concerning what his pastor has been teaching. Therefore he calls upon the pastor. And that's what we see from 515. You wouldn't find that in the English. You will only find that in the Greek. And the Lord will restore him to health. And by restoring him to health, uh, this recognizes the authority of the local pastor teacher. And it recognizes the authority that God has given that pastor teacher because when that reversionist is restored to health, everyone in the congregation will know that this is the authority. The person who has the authority is the pastor and therefore the uh, near miss, the almost face-to-face -face with death uh, of the reversionistic believer becomes a, a testimony to the fact of the authority 
of the pastor teacher. And he, and if he, <coughs> excuse me, and we will continue, and if he has produced perpetual sin, and he has from his own free will, they will be forgiven by him. That is, forgiven by God. Therefore, reversionist who has changed your mind and has apologized, now you see, acknowledge the sin to another. What does acknowledge the sin to another? It's not to just any believer. It's not to the one sitting beside you in Bible class. That would be stupid to name your sin to somebody sitting beside you in Bible class. What, the, what happens here, and this is all in the Greek, is the fact that therefore... The reversionist changes his mind concerning what he has been saying about the pastor teacher. He changes his mind. He realizes he has been wrong. So he calls upon the pastor and he apologizes to the pastor. To another means to the pastor teacher. Presbuteros is the Greek word that is used here. And then it continues. So the presbuteros the pastor teacher, offers their prayer on behalf of the reversionist. This is under grace orientation. Normally, a pastor who understands doctrine knows those who have been, for the most part, every now and then, every pastor gets bamboozled. But for the most part, a pastor knows when somebody is trying to rip his church apart. And therefore, this pastor probably already knows that somebody in his congregation is ripping him apart and trying to rip his congregation apart and trying to rip him down from his post as pastor teacher. Yet, under grace orientation, once this person has a change of mind concerning his sins, concerning his gossip, maligning, and judging of the pastor, once this person calls upon the pastor and says, You know, pastor, I apologize. I have been a real nitwit. I have questioned your ministry. I have tried to rip your ministry apart, and I have been wrong. I know you are a teacher of doctrine. I am wrong. Please pray for me as I am dying. And then that pastor must, under graced orientation, offer up a prayer on behalf of such a reversionistic believer. And then that believer will be healed. Because a prayer of a righteous believer has great power when it is operational. Therefore, once this person is healed, after he has run this pastor down and run this pastor down, the whole congregation will see that the, the authority lies with the pastor teacher. So James 5.15 and 5.16 is not talking about naming your sins to each other. It is in fact talking about the authority of the pastor teacher. And you could not find that from the English. So thank God we have the corrected translation. So from these verses you can see the enormity and the awesome responsibility that is given to the pastor teacher. So you can rest assured that when I give you an outline of what rebound is, what happens when you name your sins to God, you know I am not going to feed you something that is doctrinally incorrect. I'm not in this for money. I'm not in this for glory. I'm not in this for prestige. I'm here because I want to see each of you grow to spiritual maturity. And that is a fact. Therefore, we have noted rebound in Lessons 5 and 6. We're now on Basics Lesson 7. In Basics uh, Lessons 5 and 6, I taught to you rebound. And as a part of rebound, I had to teach you James 5.15 and 5.16 because many people get that confused. And pastors today have people getting up in front of the congregation and naming their sins to each other, which is disgusting. I see why it happens, because it's in English. But there needs to be a greater and deeper study of the Word. And thank God we have the Greek translation available for us, as given to me by Colonel R.B. Theme Jr. And I personally wish I knew the Greek, and maybe someday I'll be able to dig into that. But as of now, I am limited in what I can do, yet I want you to know that even though I am limited in terms of the Greek and in terms of the Hebrew, I am very limited in these areas. I want you to know that everything from Scripture that I give you, I'm going to comb over it until I make sure that it is completely accurate 
So what you get from me will be accurate. And therefore, if you want to continue under this ministry, you can know it will be accurate. Therefore, let's take a look at some of the points that uh, I made last week concerning rebound. Concerning the rebound technique. Now, repetition is very important. Repetition is, in fact, extremely important, and I'll tell you why. When we are born, we are born with approximately 10 billion neutrons in the brain. Now, on these neutrons, we can print Bible doctrine. Now, as we age, these neutrons die off. And the older we get, the more and more neutrons die off. Therefore, the rate of learning must never exceed the rate of forgetting. Because if the rate of forgetting exceeds the rate of learning, uh, those neutrons die off and become unavailable for print. Now, this is very important to understand. As I said, 10 billion neutrons available to be printed on in the brain. Now, God the Holy Spirit makes uh, doctrine perspicuous to us, and it's printed on our neurons as spiritual phenomenon. Now, as we get older, we're vulnerable to certain diseases. Alzheimer's, for example, destroys connective tissues between the neurons. Therefore, we become forgetful, and eventually uh, we even forget how to eat and breathe, and we die from Alzheimer's. Or uh, there are other uh, uh, diseases, uh, simply plain dementia, which is not uh, necessarily uh, if from Alzheimer's. Uh, you have a form of dementia, or what is called uh, in old age, you get senile, in which uh, a lot of the information you have printed on the neurons dies off. Now you say... Uh, does that mean every, when I get old? Look, I know of 90-some-year-old people whose neurons work better than mine. <laughs> and I, I'm being serious here. I know of some very smart people. In fact, my aunt is a very smart lady in her 90s, and uh, her neurons are working just fine. And a lot of times uh, we do uh, certain things in our uh, lives that can destroy these neurons in big clusters. For example, drug abuse destroys neurons in uh, massive amounts of clusters. And eventually, you get to the point of being a vegetable through drug, you can through drug abuse. But in fact, you lose a lot of memory through that. And uh, by the time you're old, most people who are into uh, drug addiction and drug abuse don't live to be very old because uh, they fry their brains much earlier and they usually die of a heart attack or something else. They destroy their organs and uh, the brain is an organ and it's one of those organs they're destroying. Um, and also there is excessive, now note I say excessive, alcohol Use excessive alcohol use can result in memory loss, insomnia, and uh, other difficulties in terms of excessive alcohol use. And this has to do with the 10 billion neurons that we have available. And those are a lot of neurons, but a lot of them start dying as we move on in age. Therefore, it's the importance of taking in doctrine and the real importance that I'm trying to bring out here is the fact of repetition. The more you repeat something, the more it gets, uh, it's like uh, bolding. And where I work, I do uh, word processing, and if you push bold, the print is bolder. When every time I repeat something from the pulpit and it goes to your soul, it's like putting a bold on those neurons. It's like uh, the first print comes off and you can read it and you understand it and it just flutters by. And then the next time I print right over the top of those same neurons and therefore it becomes bold and more bold. So therefore when you get older and uh, these neurons start dying off, those neurons that you have uh, received repetition on die off much at a much uh, slower pace. So that uh, if you've been uh, re if you've been listening to doctrine day after day after day, and you've been getting repetition day after day after day, 
uh, then doctrine will be the last thing that you forget when it comes to your old age or even a disease. You might get strokes, for example, destroy neurons in a uh, very severe way. So there are biological things that occur. And, of course, uh, God has uh, made uh, provision for that so that if you reach spiritual maturity and have a stroke and then all of a sudden you're out of whack... Uh, that doesn't mean God is not fair. God is fair, and He will, uh, you will uh, be sure to get your reward for going to play Roma to Theo. And uh, for example, I bring this up because in the case of the Colonel, he's having a lot of trouble with uh, his memory right now, and uh, that of course does not mean he will lose any of his rewards when he gets to heaven. And in fact, uh, I-, I can't wait to see him. Uh, in heaven, but uh, I hope to wait right now because I want to preach to you so that you can move to uh, spiritual maturity. So where were we? Uh, Talking about rebound as a part of the uh, repetition as we uh, studied these points last week. Uh, Rebound, or this is point one, rebound or utilization of 1 John 1, 9 is the first and most important problem-solving device in the Christian way of life. Point one, rebound or utilization of 1 John 1, 9 is the first and most important problem-solving device in the Christian way of life. Point two, without the foundation of rebound, which is the utilization of 1 John 1, 9, the other nine problem-solving devices of the spiritual life will never be operational for you. Without the foundation of rebound, the other nine uh, problem-solving devices of the spiritual life will never be operational for you. Point three, rejection of rebound as a problem-solving device means complete rejection of the unique unique spiritual life. Rejection of rebound as a problem-solving device means complete rejection of the unique spiritual life. Point four, rejection of rebound as a problem-solving device means rejection of the filling of God the Holy Spirit, who is your mentor and your teacher, which means you will be completely incapable of learning the spiritual matters of the Bible. That is pneumatikos. Without the filling of God the Holy Spirit, you will never have pneumatikos, and that is spiritual phenomenon. You will never be able to understand it. And I know of people who have listened to doctrine for decades, and they don't seem to understand the importance of rebound. And uh, who doesn't know the importance of rebound? Well, one way to spot them is uh, those people who add to faith for salvation don't understand rebound uh, because they will add to rebound in post-salvation. In fact, um, some people I just don't understand when that... I'm just going to move on. Rejection of rebound as a problem-solving device means rejection of the Holy Spirit. The filling of God, the Holy Spirit, who is your mentor and your teacher. The one who brings to your memory those things that you have forgotten. And that means you are completely incapable of learning the spiritual life without rebound. Paul complained of this in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. The Corinthians were not utilizing 1 John 1, 9. They were not utilizing rebound. Now, they did not uh, know or understand 1 John 1, 9 as it was pre-canon. Uh, the, as it was the pre-canon period as we know, but the Apostle Paul taught them to judge themselves, which means utilization of rebound. So the Corinthians were not utilizing this, therefore they were living under the power of the old sin nature. Therefore they did not grow up. And even though the Apostle Paul, this is what he complains about, the Apostle Paul has been giving them the milk of the word, and he continuously gives them the milk of the word, and he's ready to move on. He's ready to give them the meat of the word. He's excited about what he's learned, and he wants to impart to them the meat of the word, yet he cannot do so. He's given them the milk of the word, and they still don't understand, and that's because they are under the control of the old sin nature. That means they do not have pneumatikos in the Greek, which means in the Greek, which means spiritual phenomena. That means they are incapable, without rebound, to understand the unique spiritual life. Point five. 
Rejection of rebound means that all production, all of what you consider as good works, all the times that you have spent in Bible class, all of the energy of the flesh that you have produced, it is all converted into wood, hay, and stubble. And this is found in 1 Corinthians 3.12. And by the way, all this wood, hay, and stubble will be burned. At the Bema judgment. All of it will be burned, in fact, because it is not useful. Only the refined, the gold, the doctrine, that will be, uh, that will be issued out as, in terms of your reward. But we have not gotten to this yet, as we are still in a basic series. So let's go on to point six, which is a very important point. Rebound is not a license to sin. Now, a lot of people, I know a lot of people who say, well, actually, there are a lot of people who say that uh, the doctrine of eternal security, well, that is the doctrine of demons because, um, the doctrine of demons because uh, they say you're eternal secure, excuse me, eternally secure, that means that no matter what you do, you're going to heaven, so it's just encouraging you to sin. So that's the doctrine of demons, and that's what they say. And these people who say, that do not know that they are owned. When you believe in Christ, you you become owned. You are not your own. Even the ox knows that he has an owner. A stupid ox understands that he has an owner. When you believe in Christ, you have an owner. And that owner does not toss you to the side. You are eternally secure. So eternal security is not from the from the devil, but I'll tell you what is. The idea that you can lose your salvation. The idea that Jesus Christ did not do enough on the cross. The idea that Tetelestai was not enough. That is demon doctrine. So rebound, excuse me, rebound is not a license to sin, but it is rather a license to break free of the habitual hold of the old sin nature in order to be filled with God the Holy Spirit. Without utilization of rebound, you live out your days under the tyranny of sin. Do you understand that if you never name your sins to God, you will live out under the tyranny of the sin nature, whether you realize it or not? Now, these things are serious because there is such um, insanity going on, such a stupidity in terms of uh, what people think is spiritual going on today that it's sad. It really is sad and it troubles me and I want you to understand that I'm giving you the correct, I am giving you the Word of God and I am giving it to you Correctly, I am doing it with solemnity, and I am doing it understanding the great responsibility of all of it. And I'm not doing, I'm not going to lead you astray. Do you know how much punishment pastors receive for leading their congregations astray? So if you think for one moment I'm leading you astray through grace, that by teaching grace somehow I'm teaching you to go out and sin, you're a fool. I have never said go out and sin and sin. No, I'm teaching grace because that is the protocol of God. Now by instinct, I would now move on from the rebound technique and move to the filling of God the Holy Spirit, which would be the second problem-solving device. But since I am teaching a basic study, we need to get a better foundation of what all of this is all about. Therefore, we're going to be studying now the Trinity. We're moving now to the Trinity. Now, the word Trinity is not found in the Bible. You could flip through the Old and New Testament, and you will never find the word Trinity. And that's because it is a technical theological word that was coined in the 500s A.D. That would be the 4th century. And it is a description of a theological concept. The doctrine of the Trinity recognizes God as being one in essence, but three persons who possess equal, perfect, eternal, and infinite, identical essence. 
Therefore, Trinity is used to describe three persons in one Godhead, uh, the way that uh, March 17th we celebrate St. Patrick's Day. The way that St. Patrick uh, described the Trinity was to hold up the three-leaf clover. And here's a clover, one clover with three leaves. It's uh, uh, God and uh, one person and one essence with uh, three persons. And that's how uh, St. Patrick described that to the people he was evangelizing and also teaching the milk of the word. Therefore, Trinity is used to describe three persons in one Godhead. There is only one divine nature or being. This divine being is tripersonal, involving distinctions between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. These three persons are joint partakers of exactly the same nature and majesty of God. There is one true God, but in the unity of the Godhead, there are three co-equal, co-eternal persons. They are the same in substance or essence, but distinct, distinct, excuse me, in subsistence or continuing existence. Now this, uh, I'm spewing these things at you, you might not quite understand uh, exactly where I'm coming from. So let me, um, do you see this? This is an egg. Now, it's called an egg. Now if I crack it, and then I pour it into this dish, you see that I have a shell, I have a uh, the white, and the yolk. Now, you, all of these have different terms, different characteristics. The shell is hard. The white around it is kind of slimy. The yolk is kind of soft and mushy. And they all have different um, personalities. Yet, it is one egg. Now, this is kind of a flawed analogy, but it's one egg with a yolk and with a white around it. And uh, therefore, the trinity, one. You say God. God is one. Yes, he is. Just, just like the egg is one. And you say, but there are three different components. Well, of course there are. There's uh, there's the uh, shell, and there's the white, uh, the uh, what is called the uh, white surround the yolk, and the yolk is the uh, third person of the Trinity, so to say. So let's uh, continue. The Trinity is a revealed doctrine. It embodies truth that is never discovered. Hence, it is the hence now. Let me say this again. The Trinity is a revealed doctrine. It embodies truth never discovered. That means it is undiscoverable by natural reason. Um, in other words, like I was talking to you about pneumatikos. Uh, you can't understand spiritual matters without the filling of God the Holy Spirit. Well, the Trinity is a spiritual matter. And uh, by reason... You can never uh, understand the Trinity. An unbeliever can never understand what it mean. What what does the Trinity mean? Unbeliever can't grasp that. It can't be discovered by natural reason. And I just uh, talked to you about the egg being uh, being the egg having a shell, the whites around the yolk, and the yolk. Well, an unbeliever is not going to understand that. He's going to divide the shell up with the yolk, and you say it's egg, it's all one, it's all one egg, but it has no meaning to the unbeliever. Distinctions are made between the members of the Trinity, and this is described in 2 Corinthians 13.14, where it says, The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. So therefore we see a distinction between the members of the Trinity. We see the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of God the Holy Spirit. The Lord Jesus Christ being the second member of the Trinity, God the Father being the first, and the fellowship of God the Holy Spirit being the third member of the Trinity. The word Trinity and now we're getting into church history. The word Trinity was first used by Tertullian in the second century, that would be the 300s, to designate a Bible doctrine. The doctrine of the Trinity was confirmed by the Council of Nicaea, that's N-I-C-E-A, in A.D. 325. That was before the fall of the uh, Roman Empire, by the way. Roman Empire fell in, uh, I believe, 496 A.D. So it was confirmed by the Council of Nicaea in A.D. 325. And after much 
uh, controversy and heresy. And, of course, out of controversy comes heresy. There was the heresy of Arius, Sibelius, and Paul of uh, Samosota. And they finally came to a correct understanding of the doctrine. So um, this is all a part of church history. Therefore, the doctrine of the Trinity is defined as God is one in essence, but three co-equal, co-eternal, and co-infinite persons. In other words, each member of the Godhead uh, has the exact same attributes as the other. So God is one in essence, but three co-equal. Co-equal meaning they're all equal. Co-eternal, meaning they all possess eternal life. Uh, eternity past, there's actually no time associated with God. There's eternity past, eternity future, and uh, God is there all the time. So co-eternal and co-infinite persons. When divine essence is the subject, God is said to be one. When divine persons, excuse me, I'm getting stuffed up. When divine persons are the subject, distinction is made between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. For this reason, we have different Hebrew names for God. The plural noun Elohim, that's E-L-O-H-I-M, implies more than one person in the Godhead. The singular noun Yahweh, which is not pronounced in Hebrew, J H. W-H, notice no verb, no uh, vowel, in other words. The singular noun Yahweh, or Adonai, Yahweh, or Jehovah, is used to distinguish between the persons. Elohim emphasizes the one eff- essence of God, while Jehovah emphasizes, excuse me, Jehovah emphasizes one person in the Trinity. And usually Jehovah is emphasizing the Son of God. Now we have a scriptural verification of the fact that there is a trinity. First we have the plural noun for God. So you can write this down, point one. We have the plural noun for God, which is Elohim. E-L-O-H-I-M. This is used in Genesis 1.26 and Genesis 3.22. And that's where it says, let us. You see the word us, that's plural. Let us make man. And we see it in Isaiah 6, 8. Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Notice uh, uh, Elohim, the plural used for us. Psalms 110, verse 1. The Lord, God the Father, said to my Lord, that is uh, God the Son. So we see a distinction in the Old Testament. The distinction is delineated in Psalms 2-7. I will announce the decree of the Lord, that is God the Father. He said to me, that is God the Son, you are my Son, and that is the deity of Christ. Now, we haven't studied the hypostatic union yet, but we will. You are the Son, that means the deity of Christ. And you, you have to understand that Jesus Christ has a deity and a humanity. This day, that is the day of incarnation, I have begotten you. This is quoted three times in the New Testament in Acts 13.33, Hebrews 1.5, and Hebrews 5.5. 5. In Isaiah 48.16, come near to me, listen to this. From the first, I have not spoken in secret. From the time it took place, I was there. And now the Lord God, that is talking about God the Father, has sent me, God the Son, and His Spirit. And in Isaiah 48.16, it's talking about God the Holy Spirit. So right here from Isaiah 48.16, we can see the Trinity. So the Trinity is no mystery to those of us who are spiritual. We understand it from the Old and New Testament. Matthew 28.19 Go therefore and make disciples, that means Bible students, of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. 
Now this is a reference to the pre-canon period of the church age in which water baptism was practiced to illustrate the baptism of the Holy Spirit by the use of this ritual. And this ritual was uh, done uh, to uh, signify identification with Christ. Baptizo in the Greek means to identify yourself with Christ. And since they did not have the post-canon scriptures, since they did not have the epistles, and they did not have the completed scripture, it uh, the uh, doctrines of the New Testament had to be taught to them through ritual, and that ritual was through baptism, which meant identification. In John 10.30, Jesus said to the crowd, I and the Father are one. So therefore, Jesus is talking about the Trinity and the fact that it's three distinct persons, yet one, uh, one Godhead. He was referring to divine essence when Jesus Christ said this. And the Father and the Son are two distinct persons in the Godhead. But they do have identical essence. John 14, 16. I will ask the Father and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever. The next, the next verse explains that the counselor is said to be the spirit of truth. He abides with you and he will be in you. Thomas called Jesus both Lord and God when he saw him in his resurrection body. John twenty twenty eight. Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord, my God. First Corinthians twelve four through six. There are excuse me. First Corinthians twelve four through six. There are a variety of spiritual gifts, but the name, but the same Holy Spirit. And there are a variety of ministries, that is, opportunities for Christian service. But the same Lord, and that is talking about God the Son. And there are many different kinds of activities, but the same God, and that is God the Father, who works all of them in all persons. First Corinthians twelve four through 6 there are a variety of spiritual gifts, but the same Holy Spirit, that is the third member of the Trinity. And there are a variety of ministries, opportunities for Christian service service, but the same Lord, that is God the Son. And there are many different kinds of activities, but the same God, and that is God the Father, who works all of them in all persons. 2 Corinthians 13.14 The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. So you see the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, second, minute, second um, person of the Trinity, the love of God, first person of the Trinity, and the fellowship of God the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. 1 Peter 1.2 According to the foreknowledge of God the Father, first person of the Trinity, by the sanctifying work of the Spirit, third person of the Trinity, that you may obey Jesus Christ, second person of the Trinity. Revelation 1, 4 through 6. John to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and prosperity from him who is, that is the present state of the glorified Christ at the right hand of the Father, second person of the Trinity who has always existed, that is Jesus Christ as eternal God prior to the hypostatic union. Who is to come? That will be the second advent, that is the ending of the tribulation. And from the seven spirits before the throne. Now the seven spirits, uh, I know what they are, and I could tell you what they are. They have to do with the, uh, the seven ministries. Um, we'll get to that later when we get into Revelation. That is, uh, those types of doctrines take, uh, too long for me to get into right now uh, but the seven spirits it's interesting and um, it's interesting because uh, you could ask a, a theological student today what are the seven spirits that are mentioned in Revelation and you will get an array of answers that are absolutely outlandish and uh, when you know what they are you will you will see how simple it is and we'll get to that later God the Holy Spirit as the power system in both cre uh, Christocentric dispensations. And that is, who is to come at the second advent is God the Holy Spirit as the power system in both cre uh, Christocentric uh, dispensations. And from uh, Jesus Christ, the dependable witness, the first formed from the dead, also the ruler of the kings of the earth, to whom... 
To him who loved us, you can see I'm getting sleepy. To him who loved us and has liberated us from our sins by means of his blood. And he has provided for us a royal power as priest to God, even the Father. So we see from Revelation 4, 1 through 6, the reason why I went through all of that was to simply show you the three persons of the Trinity. So though... Uh, one in essence, God is three in persons. You can write this down. Though one in essence, God is three in persons. In the doctrine of the persons of the Godhead, the individuality of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit is preserved against the notion that there are only modes of God. The idea of modes of God is a false doctrine that dates back to the 500s AD or the 4th century. It implies that one God has various modes for various purposes in dealing with man, whether in creation or its salvation. And this is a false doctrine, and you can see the confusion that could come out of that. My goodness, if uh, God had different attributes, if each uh, person of the Godhead had a different attribute, it would be a mess. That That is part of humanizing God. You know, one God would be uh, the emotional God. The other would be... You can see the problem. So God is one, yet in himself, and from all eternity past, he is three separate and distinct persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You can write this down. God is one, yet in himself, and from all eternity past, he is three separate and distinct persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Argumentation for the Trinity begins in Genesis with the use of plural pronouns for God, where it says in Genesis 1.26, I mean it starts right off in the beginning of the Bible that there is a Trinity. And uh, a lot of the Jews had problems with this during the dispensation of the hypostatic union. Uh, Jesus Christ would talk about uh, that verse where it says, My God said to, uh, back in uh, in Psalms, I quoted that in Psalms, uh, when uh, my Lord said to uh, my Lord. Well, that's uh, two different members of the uh, Trinity, where God the Father said to God the Son. Uh, God the Father talked to God the Son, or God the Father was uh, telling uh, God the Son uh, what to do, as uh, God the Father is the author of the plan, uh, God the Son executes the plan. So God the Father is the author of the plan, and tells the Son, execute the plan. Uh, yet they are all one in the same Godhead. So, Genesis one twenty six: let us make man in our image. Therefore, more than one person in the Godhead is involved by the the uh, us. See us? That means plural. Let us make man in our image. And uh, we'll wrap this up shortly here. Genesis 3.22 Then the Lord God said, Behold, man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. Notice there the use of the pronoun us. It's not saying me, it's saying us. Therefore, three members of the Godhead. Therefore, the Trinity. Now, most of you, um, probably all of you here have heard about the Trinity. And uh, yet, we're going through the Trinity in detail. And uh, we will continue to go through the Trinity in the next message. And when... You will note, when we get to the abode of God, where is the Trinity today? You will find out some magnificent and phenomenal things. And right now, while this might be a bit boring and technical, I'm getting to a point. There is always an application to these things. And when we get to the abode of God, for example, where does God the Father, God the Holy Spirit and God the Son reside. And you say in heaven. Yes, they reside in heaven. But wait till you see where else they reside. And when we get to this, I'm not going to spoil it. We're going to get to this in the next message. And you're going to see where the abode of God is. Where the Trinity actually uh, resides. And when we get to this, it is phenomenal. Because this has not existed in dispensations past and will not exist in dispensations in the future. It is phenomenal 
what we have been given to us as church age believers. And I want to exhort you as a pastor should to be motivated with doctrine. Some of these things might be a bit boring. Some of these things might be a bit tedious. But you need a foundation. And you need to stick with doctrine. And it is extraordinarily important. And I am excited about uh, what is about uh, about what I'm about to teach to you in the next few lessons. Therefore, Father, with your head with your head bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for this wonderful opportunity to study your Word. Thank you for letting us understand the fact that the authority resides in the pastor teacher. Thank you for letting us understand your protocol in all situations. Thank you for letting us understand the doctrine of the Trinity. Thank you for letting us understand your grace. And may God the Holy Spirit enlighten us and challenge us. And may he bring to our memory these things which uh, we could very easily forget so that we might grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, so that we might reach the ultimate of Pleroma to Theu. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.